and you should be set up. First question for everybody here. Please, rent the, just within your own organizations, just chat a little bit about this. Take about two minutes to get this answer done. If you could change or alter or fix or add or something, one thing that would help your organization to be more successful, what would it be? Two minutes starts now. seconds. All right. When people quiet down, I figure that's probably uh, who we got to. Now, the interesting part about this exercise is that typically the people that answer it say something like, gosh, I wish my CRM were better, or gosh, I wish my customer service people were better at what they did, or I wish we had a better food service, or I, I you know, wish our, our building was newer or nicer, or that we had better tech, or that our Wi-Fi actually worked, or, or something like that. And yet, what I really wanted to get to today is why we're all here, and that's if we changed this just a little. If you could change, alter, add, or fix one thing about yourselves that would improve the company, what would it be? See, the challenge for all of us here in the room is that we can fix ourselves. We can't necessarily go back and write a million dollar check for CRM or whatever else we have. The real challenge for all of us here, for those of you who have spent the majority of the day here, it's been an outstanding panel of, of, of experts all day long. And I've reveled in being able to listen to all of them. And yet I was hoping that some of you would talk about yourselves when you asked about what I'm going to fix when I get back home. Because that's the one thing you have control over. And so what I hope will happen is that through the course of the next several minutes, we're going to go through some of the stuff that we talked about today. So if you weren't here for the whole thing, you'll actually get a rewind of some of this stuff. But you'll get to talk about it with some of your people in small chunks about what you're going to do as a part of your efforts to go back and actually get ROI from your exercises here and what you'll actually do about that time. In fact, it'd be kind of fun. You can actually bring this exercise back home and take this very wording back to your people and ask them the very same thing. Might be pretty effective. So I want to go right back, and we're going to do this three or four speakers at a time, and then I'm going to get together, with, and I'm going to ask you to go again and say, what are you going to take back home as a result of having heard these little chunks of the individuals who, who spoke today? Going back, all the way back to Josh Manley from Reply By, if you can reply to exec sessions, you can now buy tickets, and you found out that the Brooklyn Nets had a ton of these things that they had done, so there are over 1,200 people that adopted the program, and 10.2% of them committed to a sale, which is pretty strong. 38,000 bucks in ticket sales just from text messages. That was a pretty interesting piece, and so if indeed if you got that last time, I don't know if you wrote that down, see, geez, I gotta look that up. Maybe that's something you might be able to do. Second speaker we had was Brett. Really enjoyed hearing from him. I've known Brett for a long time, and I finally get to see him do his training thing and actually do it on live on stage with you all here. Took a lot of great chunks from Brett's presentation. I hope all of you took great notes, because selling yourself comes down to two things, he said. He said, being yourself and making the conversation all about them. 
I hope most of you took that down. You're the expert, and that's what we need to be able to do. And Brett said it extremely well, that not, don't sell yourself short. Even the people who are brand new, that take command of the sales conversation. You ought to tell your prospects what they should buy versus ask. You ought to lead them versus follow. You ought to teach others versus learn. These big, hairy, audacious statements that Brett likes to use. I thought he did an excellent job of being able to convince, speaking intelligently and passionately about your team, and also speaking intelligently and passionately about how your product solves challenges. It's great stuff. Of course, he talked about clans. Jeez, I even found the same picture with eyes in it. How about that? We found out that selling your team is way awesomer than selling clams. And I hope all of you took that away as well. He also mentioned the mirror test, which I think is something you can bring back and ask all of your people. Would you buy from you? Would you? We also had a chance to listen to Justin from the Sacramento Kings, who I thought did an outstanding job as well, talking about the NBA's sales DNA study, about how nine motivators that they asked 1,400 people within the NBA and the sales team to do, they found out the top three are skill development, career growth, and sense of belonging. Salary was like way down toward the bottom. They think, well, if we just pay them more, they'll stick around. That has nothing to do with it. Fascinating stuff. And then he went on to talk about some of the other things that he had learned, that the core leadership practices that they took a look at is there's a servant leadership philosophy that he has. There's a commitment to daily engagement with his staff and to be as transparent as possible, that those things were the things that they really wanted to have, not the giant paychecks. Again, what could you bring yourself back home? You bring that home. You don't need a requisition for that. You don't have to go to a budget meeting and ask for some of these things. Has great buy-in from his staff. He told great stories of how he does those monthly team building activities. In fact, was surprised himself. I was really uh, taken by his transparency and saying, you know, I got it wrong. I thought they really wanted money and cash and all kinds, you know, pin a hundred dollar bill up to the wall and say anybody in the next, next sale is gonna get this. But what he found was that people were actually more fired up to do a better job if they had monthly team building exercises. Fun stuff to motivate top performance. Those were just the first three speakers. Get with your partners, 60 seconds. What are you going to take away and actually use from those three speakers that will perhaps make your trip worthwhile here? What you take home that you'll be bringing back? Talk about it with your, with your groups right now. 60 seconds. All right. Great stuff. Justin was then followed up later on in the morning by Ken Troop, my good friend Ken from Sports Desk Media, who had much to say about professional development. Selling, just by building relationships, reading, never stop learning and planning, have solid life goals. And it's probably one of those things we don't do enough with our people is to make sure that we know what it is they want to achieve beyond the next month's goal. What do they want for themselves? He talked about street cred, which I really like, and that's something you could probably bring home yourself. Have your people got street cred? Do they have that swagger about them? Do they have what's going on that they need? What is their social voice saying about who they are in the Twitterverse, with their LinkedIn profile, with the blog entries they may have, and some of the other things that you'd had? Then we had Amy, Amy Venuto. I know she's here, there she is. 
Great job up there, Amy. You had all kinds of things to say about going full menu versus the silos. Many pros and cons, she went through all the pros and cons, and certainly there are lots of benefits of going full menu. Your dimension, the, the sales staff gets multidimensional, they, there's more revenue streams that come, you can have cross-sell and upsell opportunities, and several others. And of course her answer, over and over, we heard it, solutions based selling. It is not a silver bullet, however, and she cautioned us to make sure that if you choose to do this, you'll want to be care careful of a couple of things. You don't want to have people show up, throw up, and split. And it happens a lot. You don't want to have people not listening. Just because they have all the stuff to sell doesn't mean they're not supposed to listen to what's being said. Maybe you have a, if they have a territory that isn't necessarily right, that's something you have to be considerate, consideration of as you do this full menu thing. The improper pricing, if there's a pricing issue, or if there's some sort of incentive or reward that really isn't an incentive or a reward, that it just sits there. Amy's two go-to phrases, if you didn't get them, which I thought were outstanding today, was what's your number one goal in the upcoming year? If your people aren't using that, that might be one to bring home if you didn't write it down earlier and using social proof. Other companies, other CEOs, other people in your position have said terrific stuff that your people ought to be using. And good things from Amy. Then we had Al and Paul, the tag team duo, who really, for, for as far as content, may have been one of the richest of all with regard to the stuff that we learned up here. I mean, it was just great stuff. The analytics and CRM stuff is, is and we learned from them, at least from Al's side and, and from Paul's side, spreadsheet days are dead. I'm afraid several of you cringed when you saw that. There are a few teams that I work with that still work with Excel spreadsheets. And it, it's hard to believe in today's society, the way that we're working, that, that that would be the case. And there are teams that you would know and recognize. You know, it's funny, they don't make a single cold call at the Niners. We learned that today. And analytics allows every one of their reps to be more systematic in their efforts. Now it's interesting, it's a coordinated strike is what they called it. There's marketing, there's analytics, there's sales, and that's what they use it for. Uh, Al's quote of the day, one of them anyway, was activity levels of reps aren't the only measure of success anymore. And it's interesting because he can do this knowing that there's analytics and there's other tools that he's given his people to be able to, to, be able to say stuff like this. How truly effective are you at your job? That the measures of success that we sure grew up with, Rob, are pretty much done and, and, and moving off to the side, at least are moving in that direction. And certainly the Niners are at the forefront of that. And I was grateful to be able to hear that. Uh, I asked, I don't know if anybody's here with that, but I asked them, is that creepy to fans? I mean, what, what sort of a creepiness factor does that allow? Because, because we're in, in uh, the area that has a very high tech savvy kind of area. If you're in Silicon Valley, it might be different than if you're in another part of the country. And the quote that I got from Al was that we found that if we're enhancing the fan experience by knowing their data, people are more tolerant about us knowing more about them. So if there's something in it for them, it's really okay. Speakers four, five, and six. Get with your partners. What did you learn from those three that you'll take away that was valuable?
All right. Then right after the tag team of Alan Paul, we had Matt Harper. I, I know many of you were, I was at least, inspired by Matt. I mean, he's doing a wonderful job motivating what many of us feel is an unmotivatable group, these millennials. And I thought his message was right on. Don't believe in stereotypes. It's very easy for us, who are not necessarily in that age group, to do that. Because we hear it so often, it's something all of us talk about in the management circles. You know, if, when I was your age, it just doesn't work. There's just no way in which to do that. You have to know what drives and motivates them. And, and I learned today that fear doesn't work. And I hope you learn that too. At least in the case of millennials. What are some good things about them? Well, Matt outlined, he said they're motivated for immediate success. That millennials really understand the value of mentors, perhaps even more so than any other generation prior, because they understand that knowledge is power and that if they can be connected and the connections they can gain from that knowledge can actually get them where they need to go a lot faster. You know, the old adage, it's not what you know, but who you know, has probably never been more true than today. That they have to be coachable, willing to learn. And that they're very creative. We don't have to coax it out of them. That it actually comes naturally to those in this generation because they're used to having to solve complex problems. Love this quote that he has as he's doing his interview. And I think many of us in a leadership role at hire probably could stand to learn a thing or two from this. Give me 12 to 15 months, you who I am attempting to hire. Give me that time. If you crush it here at that, in that time frame, in that 12 to 15 months, I will do everything in my power to make sure I get you the job you really want. You know, my guess is, and I'm just speculating here, I don't know if Matt is still here, but I'll bet he probably has some people stick around after 12 or 15 months, wouldn't you? A portion of them, at least, that would be looking to follow a guy like that. That someone who's willing to go to bat for me that much and I'm enjoying it so much, I think I might be willing to hang out. Maybe do a little bit more. We learned 10 things that motivate millennials, which I found really interesting. One is the immediate feedback, both positive and negative. And certainly I find that in my work, but certainly in, in many others, maybe you've not noticed that as much, but they love the negative as well as the positive. You know, I think in some cases we think, oh gosh, you know, their egos are really fragile. We shouldn't tell them about the negative. We should, you know, the sandwich technique, right? But I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. They want to know what they're screwing up. And I really enjoyed Matt, hearing that from Matt to validate some of the things that I've been thinking myself. What else motivates them? On the job training, on the phones, not necessarily in the boardroom or in the, the conference room all the time. They have to be able to work it. This generation, for those of you who not know, have been labeled the crash test geniuses. Uh, it's uh, those who just pick up a video game, never read the, the instructions, you just take it and you just die enough times until you figure out how not to die. And I think that might hold true in this case on the telephones as well. Train them on what to do, not how to do it. Allow them the creativity to do it a way that you might not necessarily train yourself, but you could then sit back and say, hmm, that really didn't go so bad. I loved his examples of a couple of the calls he was listening to that he wanted to jump out and say, hey, don't say that, but instead decided to step back a little bit and allow that creativity to soar. And what he learned out of that was extraordinary. They are motivated by money, but you can get creative with some of those ways. Maybe you reach certain benchmarks or thresholds with your pay grade that if you make this kind of money, you now get a certain percentage above that. That money still motivates, but perhaps can be presented in a different way to millennials. That you reward them. I love the story about going to the Nike store in Beaverton, where you get 50% off, which I didn't know. I don't know if anybody's been to the store. I, I'm guessing the University of Oregon probably gets some sort of special access. What do you think? So that's another. So there were five others that he talked about. Clear expectations for success. That they know exactly what the roadmap was. And, and one of the things that I'm struck by, and for those of you who've been in, in the industry for as long as I have, the, the, uh, you'll remember way back before the little bug on the screen was there to be able to watch a, a sporting event. If you look back at the early 80s 
and you look back at some of the ESPN classic things like the Bird versus Magic, NBA Finals, sorts of things, they only showed graphics on the screen at two different times. It was after somebody made a basket, after it changed, and then during either a timeout or a commercial break. And if you remember, the graphics were just horrible. They were like somebody went to Walmart and got little stick things and put them on the screen or something. But the, the prevailing notion at the time was that those graphics got in the way of what the spectators wanted to see on TV, the performers, the players. Today, and I believe Fox was the first to do this, but I don't have verification of this, the bug that's at the top or the bottom of the screen to be able to show you what the time is, what the score is, and everything in, in a nutshell, and the top, if you don't see that today, you're going crazy. You know, where's, what's the score? Where's that thing? It's not on the screen. And your people need to know that too, and especially the millennial generation. They need to know what their score is at all times, so they know how hard they need to work. That they have the expectations. And to focus more on what you do and not when. I'm not sure if any of you kind of, that rocked you a little bit, but to have some of your people coming in and calling at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or to go out to a Chamber of Commerce function late, late at night or do a deal at somebody's house at 9.30 in the evening. I mean, I don't know if somebody felt a little uncomfortable listening to that, but if that's the way they need to succeed, perhaps that's something we ought to be listening to. Seek their input and encourage collaboration. We all know that when someone helps create something, they have mutual buy-in and they're more likely to be excited about the finished product. It is apparently especially true amongst the millennial generation. To build the relationship and to have that trust and to discuss their future goals and aspirations, to actually sit down and say, where would you want to take your career? Knowing, of course, that it may change as their life changes. But to have the chance to sit down and do that, I thought was exceptional. Then we heard from Ben. I won't even try it. Thanks, Ben, the last name. But I love the new ABCs of sales, and I love this always be connecting, because I think that's something all of us can relate to because of all that's happened with connecting. That you ought to think of LinkedIn as your own personal website. That was an aha for me. And he mentioned three core areas, the picture, that you ought to have the team logo in the background. I hope some of you will then change your photo after today if you don't have the logo in the background. I know some of you have always been told have the, you know, the blue background or whatever, and you have a suit and tie, and hope it has to look the right way. Maybe we can loosen up on that a little and still make it look professional with the logo in the background. And he shared with us several examples of that, which I thought were great. That you ought to have a heading that doesn't sound like a job title or a, a business card, but way more like the benefits that you can bring to someone. And a summary. What's your story? And why do you value the live experiences that you sell? I thought that was really well done. When you're prospecting, you talked about searching or prospecting one core vertical at a time, that you ought to go deep into a single or two or three vertical markets at the time, that you ought to search those key decision makers next, find out what the titles are, and then LinkedIn invites with a nice special message. And one thing I learned is to be sure and click we've done business together, even if you haven't done business together. Boy, it sounded like it was like contradictory, but it seemed to make sense because you're actually saying, gee, we haven't done business together at the end when you put the personal note in, but I would like to connect, perhaps do business in the future. Then we had Chip. Really appreciated Chip's view on driving sales and overperforming. And I think some of us who have been in minor league sports can relate a little bit to what Chip had said. It, it's, it's sometimes slightly disconcerting to call it minor league because I think so many great things are happening there that it's, it's a, a little challenge for us to continue to have that label. But, you know, he's a terrific leader of people, and, and he mentioned the A talent, as Steve Jobs would call it, A talent it attracts A talent, B talent attracts B and C talent. Why do people want to work for you? I thought that was a great question he asked. Why do they want to work for you? And he went deeper into that. Do you have a plan to grow and develop the talent? Do you have, do you have fun, and are you awesome? It's a great question. Maybe a challenge to some of the people that, uh, back at your place. Are you having fun, and are you being awesome? And the fact that culture is a real manager. To have a plan by effort. You can't replace picking up the phone, so don't try. And to also have accountability. And the challenge he threw down for us is, where are you compromising? Three other speakers. What are you going to take away? 60 seconds with your partner. Seven, eight, and nine. What struck you?
All right. We then moved on. Once Chip had done his thing, uh, we went to perhaps the most confusing guy of the day. For those of you who could follow him, you physics professors in the room, or those who are into economics, he's sports pricing psychology guy. Uh, we cannot sell based on price alone, we must build value. And I don't know what your notes looked like at the end. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps that was yours. Then I added a little bit more, and then I added some more, and then I added some more, and then I added some more, and I was just done. <laughs> I couldn't handle it. It was too much to handle. So I did take a few notes, however, some nuggets from what he took away. I kind of liked the fact that we ought to display a dollar savings and the percentage off. I thought that made sense logistically and, and uh, from a, just a, a, a cognitive perspective that we ought to be able to show that because some people think in two different ways. And I thought that made t a ton of sense. That the word over and the word free are very powerful. We would say over 50% off or something to that nature. That that really stood out to me. That if you bundle commonly bought items, that that might be able to give you a, a little bit of a lift in total revenue spend. Certainly that's something that all of us have toyed with and maybe have done successfully, but this might be a reminder for some of you saying, hmm, you know about that thing we just added a year ago? Why didn't we put that in with the other things? And maybe there was an opportunity for you to put some things together. To use the small stair step, what he called stratified price points, that you don't jump from the $100 package to the $500 package. But you make the 100 and then 125 and then a 165 and to make it so appealing that it just makes sense to get the 165 versus the 100. We've all lived this, right? As a consumer, we've all, I would say, fallen prey to that and makes it sound like it's horrible. But certainly we have been attracted by a larger package with significantly more value for the larger price. Lifetime share of wallet. Don't know if that was a new concept to several of you, but it probably is something to bring back and talk about. Season ticket holders sometimes, are, we, we tend to be somewhat myopic looking at one year deals and thinking, okay, there's our money for the year but what's the lifetime value of that person, that share of wallet? And to look for the hooks that bring the greatest return for the lowest cost. Then my friend Rob Sign came up, and I've known Rob for several years, and it was great to see him back up because we don't get to see him on the training front much anymore because he's off with the Pac-12 doing his stuff, but one of the things he is well known for in the industry is his success with group sales, and I was very glad to see him bring some of his nuggets to all, excuse me, to all of us. People buy what tickets can do and not what they are. And I think that's sometimes so difficult for us to remember. They don't buy that little piece of paper with the picture of a player on it or the picture on the smartphone now. They buy what it can do for them. And to help people figure out what they do better at your place versus their place can be a wonderful opportunity for people to get more excited about what they do and for you to benefit at the same time. I love his examples of seeing a book club sign. Book club meets here Thursday, 7 p.m. And to have that at your venue instead of at the book club location. Girl Scout meetings. Who'd have thought to go into a Girl Scout meeting looking for a group sales opportunity? Rob's an absolute master at that, and I hope you took a few ideas away that you'll be able to bring. His question, what if, has been used a lot of different ways at a lot of different times by many, many teams. And if it was the first time you heard it, I hope you'll take it home. What if I was able to get your not-for-profit exposure to 10,000 people attending our event? You know, to do things like the meet the photographer event or the tour the lighting system, tour the AC system, who'd have thought? You know, to be able to look at, whoa, let's go see air conditioning systems. Wasn't something that excited me, but obviously it did others. Those education events, those lawyers and others who have to have CEUs could certainly be done at your place versus others. And to be able to build a group night, the questions that he's posed to all of us to be thinking about is, who are we really targeting? What is our goal in this? How many seats do we want to sell? What sort of groups, what sort of subgroups are a part of that? Where are we going to find them? And please be more creative than just say, hey, let's just look on Google. 
thought that was well said. Why should they care about coming to the group night? I'm always struck, and maybe you are too, with the number of people who show up at our Susan Coleman nights and the ASPCA things. And, you know, and by the way, some sort of a hockey game is going to break out. But they just show up because they so believe in the cause. What makes you, as a team, as an organization, more special than the others who are organizations similar to yours in the marketplace? And he put a few challenges out to us. I love the concept of selling somebody two at a time. I don't know if any of you were doing the math, but if every group sale you made was doubled, what would that mean to your life? The interesting thing, as he mentioned this, is there's no two groups that are exactly the same. It might be the weather, it might be the people who can show up. Not everybody can come at one time, so you'll have an entirely different mix of people on two separate occasions. If you sell them both at one time, you have that much less to have to go follow up on in terms of a sales effort. Never settle for good enough and think bigger. Those were his mantras in succeeding. And what he discovered in his time is that the real sale is to the attendees, not to the group leader. That might have been an aha for some of you here in the room. That you work so hard to sell the group leader that maybe we ought to work a little harder on getting to those who are coming and sell them, perhaps, a little harder. To get them excited, not just interested. And I love his comparison that, you know, hey, I'm interested. We've sure known a lot of people who were interested that didn't give us a single dime. I want people that are excited. People buy for their reasons, not yours. And then number 12, Ruby, my pal from the National Speakers Association, the seven star service lady, gave us a few pointers about fan engagement and retention that everyone's in the sales department, including your service people. Love some of the stats that she brought that a commitment to customer experience is the same as getting 25% more retention or revenue. I imagine your CFO would probably perk up at that. That a 5% increase in customer retention brings up profits by 25 to 95%. Just 5% more. And she brought a lot of different opportunities, the type of customer's experience. And we went all through those throughout the room, the ticket purchase, the apps, all the things that can be touched in terms of when your people are in the venue. 10, 11, and 12 different speakers, three others. Talk to your partners. What will you be bringing home and implementing and implementing from those. Take a moment. And our final three speakers of the day in a jam-packed 15-speaker session. Wow. Might have been the most informative for me. Phil has obviously done his homework, and he's interested in all the newest, coolest stuff. And I was pl very pleased to be here to hear about what the cutting-edge stuff is happening is Sales 3.0, which uh, you might want to go brand and, and get a copyright on, Phil so that you have it, uh, developed it out of a need for a better way. So many of the best inventions of society always are there because there's a need. And indeed, when his people got together, they just felt, man, there's got to be a better way than making all these calls and doing what we're doing and, and coming up with the acronym Social Accelerated 
and collaborative was what they did. That not only did they, how that they wanted to sell, which was easier, what they were recognizing in the marketplace was that the way others wanted to buy was shifting. And so they began focusing on some of the technology that would help both causes. And all these amazing tool, uh, very cool tools that he found to do that, that everybody gets LinkedIn sales navigators. Now certainly he would tell you that the subscription alone will not sell seats, that you have to know how to use it. There's some expertise that goes along with that and it doesn't just magically create leads out of thin air. You have to be able to plug it in and to be able to do the right things with it if you're a subscriber. But he has many, many email engagement things. He, he puts the tweets on Hoopla. For those of you who are not familiar with Hoopla, you can talk to Phil a little bit about it or any from the Kings. But when they make a sale, the, the thing goes crazy like Sports Center, and it plays your walk-up song and, and the money that you sell. It's very cool the way it all works. He talked about people links, how they can track the LinkedIn and Twitter activity so they can maximize their success with those things. Find out which articles that they send out. If, they happen to, if the construction vertical is being sent an article, they can find out which of those construction articles are being opened more often so that they can make sure that the others are doing the very same thing. Brilliant stuff. The one mob using the rep selfie that we heard. Tout app, which tracks email open times. The Google Plus for doing renewals, which I thought was brilliant. What he said was, don't save your best tools for your best people. Everyone deserves the same opportunity for success. And in fact, may need it even more. Lots more amazing, cool tools he shared. He said there's a YouTube channel of all of their people doing individual YouTube videos for the different sections. So you could just click on 115 or 117, and there's somebody from their sales staff who's talking, hey, we're sitting in section 117. Brilliant. By the way, you don't need a requisition for that either, because you could go do that right now. Dial source you may need a purchase app for, because that's the dialing accelerator that uh, indeed is uh, a little bit of money. But indeed, it, with this predicted call technology, man, how much more productive could your people be? And Phil certainly believes in weekly, monthly training, which I was glad to see. Uh, the Creepy Tool of the Day Award, the Sociometric Solutions. For those of you who were involved in, in radio, because that was my career for quite a while, we had the, uh, the, personal, the people meters, which was what we called them in, in Arbitron. It actually listens to the radio stations that you're exposed to through the course of a week, and it records them for Arbitron. Uh, this was kind of that same sort of thing, but in a much creepier way, he found out who people were talking to. Imagine that. Boy, can you, the detective agencies that could use something like that just to plant it, this is astounding. But what he found out, this was the amazing part, top performing sales reps were not talking as much to the other people. And so what he wanted to do is get them together so that there was some of that sharing of information. So not only do you just collect the data because it's fun and because it's the newest, hottest thing, but he found a way to use the data to plug it in to make it valuable. And I think that's the real point there. Then we had Russ Scabetti from Core Software talking about data. And I had to tell you, on my side, it's more of a foe because I'm just not into it. I'm more the you know, right brain, creative stuff, and, and it's just way organized for me. But I learned a whole lot during this session. Uh, that the 30-day challenge that they put ahead, and I would have been interested to see who the other sales reps were that thought that their organic self-prospecting people could crush the guys with the data. Well, they found the opposite. The data crushed them. And that there were four different data types that he shared with us. And that in those, there were personics clusters and things that you might do with those to be able to, lead, to score those leads and maybe to look out for things that might skew some of the results you get. That it isn't enough just to look at five-star leads and say, ooh, let's just call those. There are some things to look out for with regard to those leads that need to be monitored closely. Data is your friend. Give data a chance. Love your data. Take it to dinner. He didn't say that, but I did. Be an active part of the data process rather than simply on the sidelines. And then Jason, we just finished up talking about premium sales. And I think sometimes the simplest explanations or the simplest solutions can be the best. And he gave it to us. Ask simple questions, especially on the phone. Be sure to ask for some help if you need it. Due diligence is something you've got to do with these bigger, longer term deals. And to find out what success is for them is absolutely paramount. You gotta listen, listen, listen. And you got to be likable. You know, certainly Jason's a likable guy, and he's personified that here, and it's one of the things that's made him a success. But how likable are you? 
There are some things you might bring back to your people or indeed use yourself. You know, work to understand who they are and to be that solution for them. Some common ground. Find out what it is they do that maybe you have some in common. Maybe they travel a lot. Maybe they do some other things that you can somewhat relate to. Maybe they have relatives in the same area in New Mexico that you have. Whatever it happens to be, to find that out. To let them be comfortable with the options that are on the table. And I love this phrase, using access to the access to be able to use that stuff that you have at your disposal to make people feel, far, feel, feel part of the elite club that sometimes we need to have them feel. And then the upselling and selling up. The work those internal connections inside it can be really important as well. 60 seconds with your group. What'd you take away from those three speakers? Two more minutes. One thing that I would like to send you away with, and, and there's some great food waiting for you, there's some people outside with the uh, trade show and such that'll be a lot of fun, and, and uh, I'm told you'll be really treated well at Cal today uh, with the tour and everything else that's going on, so it, it, that'll be fun. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, like 60 seconds though, about a common theme that you heard today that was not expressed yet on the screen. It has to do with entrepreneurship. Because I think in our world where we're going, with regard to how we're wanting to build our salespeople, that entrepreneurship is really what we want to build. If you look at the definition, if you really go and get granular with entrepreneur, by definition, it's a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses taking on greater than normal financial risks in order to do so. And gang, those are us. That's us. We are entrepreneurs, if you look at yourself that way. The challenge we have, of course, in our business is to get people to look at themselves that way. I would submit that if you were to bring this question back to your people, you might get some really interesting answers. Do you think of yourself, sales rep for our company, do you think of yourself as an entrepreneur today? And ask them this question when you have the opportunity to bring it up. What do you notice about people who act as if they own the place? The interesting story about that, if you're at a restaurant or you're somewhere where somebody is just hustling their ass off, going around, back and forth, the highest compliment you can give someone as an employee is to say, wow, they act as if they own the place. Can that be said of you or the people that are under your watch? It's a fantastic goal to have. And as a sports sales professional, let me suggest that you or those who report to you are knowledgeable idea starters. You're business matchmakers. You are a creator of opportunities for others, most often when they don't recognize them themselves. They are a positive force for good for others. I hope your people are pleasantly persistent, because entrepreneurs certainly are. 
and that they are an entrepreneurial professional, just like many of your clients. And your clients will relate to entrepreneurs just like them far better if they come across that way. Gang, I, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to do this. Gang, that was, you just experienced the entire sports boot camp in 40 minutes. So give yourselves a round of applause. Thanks for sticking around. We'll see you on the dance floor. Can I get a big round of applause for Bill Gertin and all of the boot campers that you know, came out and spoke today? Thank you guys very much. Remember that the trade show is open. 